So let's start with easy, and that will be removing this radiator support. I'm gonna get this grill off here, because it's gotta go as well. I don't even have a bolt there. Which is nice. Get off of there. A couple little marker lamps. Got those for replacements as well. It's gonna be nice when it's done. There you go, that's all there is. That and their half inch bolt right there. And the grill is off. So I'm not exactly for sure what this thing is. Probably some sort of vapor filter. Well, that's broken. So, we're not gonna probably put this back on there. Wrong size, of course. Is it 10 millimeter? It is. That's crazy. Not 3 8 not 7 16 Must be metric. The one metric bolt that I found on this thing. Yep, some sort of uh, vapor filter, I guess. All right, this should be pretty straightforward. We're gonna unhook our horns that sound like a dying calf and just don't work. And unclip our wiring harnesses, or harness. Now, these radiator supports were pretty bad on these trucks about rotting out. This one's not that bad. It's got a little rust started in it on this side, but I think I can save it, which is a good thing. Just one less thing to buy, right? So here's a little bit of useless trivia for you. These trucks came out in 1973. That was the first year of the square body, which really I think GM called them their rounded line, and the public gave them the name square body simply because the, the you know they're pretty square. And uh, one of the first trucks to ever, one of the first or the first ever to be designed using wind tunnel data. So I thought that that was pretty neat. You know, my dad owned these growing up. He owned them ever since I can remember. Still owns two really nice ones. My brothers owned them as well, and in order to be cool, I had to own them you know, also. So since I was probably 18 to now, I've owned every flavor of square body that was pretty much available, every style anyway, which didn't change a whole lot. Headlights, grills, you know, features. That's pretty much it for 15 years. Basically, this truck went unchanged. And I remember growing up that parts were everywhere. You could go to the junkyard, your buddy had two of them sitting behind his barn, and, you know, get by. These were a pretty affordable truck, and uh, everybody had them. So that's why I like them. You know, a little, little bit of sentimental attachment to the old, the old square body. Plus, they're pretty simple. You know, not a lot going on here as far as electronics go. You've got all that you need and none about what you don't, like big navigation screens and the headrests and proximity sensors that constantly go bad, tire pressure sensors that send faults to your dash and buzz and drive you insane. All the stuff you need, none of the stuff that you don't. The old square body. All of the old trucks were like that, not just the Chevrolets. So I'm partial to them. Pretty neat old pickups, really. So I went ahead and pulled the upper radiator hose and sucked all the coolant out of this thing. There's our thermostat, 180 degree Fahrenheit thermostat. It's when it opens, allows fluid to circulate through the engine or coolant. Now I can remember very clearly my dad bringing these in the house and dropping them into a pot of boiling water to see if they would open. And I believe this is just a wax motor. There's a wax in here that melts at a certain temperature. This is what I believe. 
and when wax, when it melts like paraffin, it expands quite a bit and pushes against this spring and opens this uh, valve here. So let's see if we can't open this thing. Without cooking our hand. Okay, our hand is getting warm, so I probably should have been a smart guy and got some pliers. Get some pliers, be a smart. And there it's all the way open. We'll blow the layer on it so it closes quickly and you'll see it close. So removing that coolant with the shop vac works extremely well. I've used that a bunch. I've also used air hose into the top radiator hose to force it out the bottom while somebody's catching it in a five gallon bucket. A little more messy, but works as well. It keeps you from having to get antifreeze all over the shop because a lot of that antifreeze stays stuck in the block and you know, you pull the engine and it's dumping everywhere and your dogs and cats are running around drinking the stuff. Not good, right? So to avoid all that, Shop vac works pretty good. You can even clean your shop vac before you do it and reuse the coolant. So, also keeps you from spoiling your engine oil if you have to pull your intake or your heads off, because otherwise that stuff, you know, just dumps down in there and that's not good. So, remember that if you've never seen that before. It is a good method. Works extremely well. I think, in my opinion, by far the hardest part of this job is the cleanup. Everything that you can imagine is just covered in grease and dirt and rust. And in order for you to get it back looking decent again, it has to be clean enough to accept paint. And you want to fix any cracks or any rust to stop that from progressing. You know, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it. I know there's a lot of people who'd rather get in a bar fight with Chuck Norris than to jump in here and start cleaning. But it is part of it. And once you get moving, it's not too bad, but it seems like it will never, ever end the cleanup. So if you'd be so kind to glue your eyeballs down on the steering box and watch it when I turn the steering wheel back and forth, how much this thing flexes. Now the frame is broke under this and I haven't repaired it yet, but I just want to see, right? And I want you to see maybe a before and after. Uh, hopefully it'll stiffen the frame up after the repair, but check that out. So quite a bit of flex down there, and I can see a crack you know, down there as well. So we'll have to pull this off and put our repair plates on there, and hopefully that'll stiffen up this whole frame here and contribute to a tighter, tighter steering truck, right? One that's not at risk of the steering box breaking off while we're driving down the road. Uh, it happened, not to me, but to some people.
go get the frame cleaned up. Just used a wire wheel, cleaned it up all around where I'm gonna be putting on this reinforcement bracket. And we're gonna do a quick crack check on this thing using our uh, die penetrant. So you'll be able to see where all the cracks are. Pretty bad right here. Well, right here and here. So we got her dye on there. I'm gonna wipe this off and then we'll spray our developer on there. And hopefully it will show up where the cracks are really good. Yeah, that worked pretty good. So we got one big crack that runs down through here and it looks like it stops about right there. And then obviously you can see this one, it's kind of spider webbed around through here. So all I'm gonna do is grind these out like you've seen me done before, seen me do before. And then we'll MIG that up and then we'll start working on our patch panels. So I saved you from all of the grinding and uh, burn out noise. As you can see, we got it pretty good. Hogged out all the way around. Not quite a quarter inch wide, but you know, the size of the burr. All the way down to the bottom of the cracks, we drilled them all out. Got the little Weld Pro 210 LCD that I've been using. Got it ready to go. And I'm backing my weld up with this little, little magnetic finger so I can buzz this thing hot and not blow through. That's the idea. So I guess it's time to weld all this up and then grind it down nice and flush so our repair plate can go over top of this. I know I own gloves. I just don't know where they're at. My hands fit in these. Um, kind of. So we've got the frame all cleaned up in this area. Got our patch panels here that was sent to me by a viewer. So thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Now, at one time this truck had been hit in the rear and I believe they put it on a frame rack and kind of tweaked it around. It wasn't hit that hard, but maybe hard enough to torque the frame a bit. So it's got a little bit of damage here from the frame guy. So I'm gonna have to knock that in. So my patch panel fits a little tighter. I definitely want this thing to be snug up against the frame when I weld it. So 
There we go. We'll have to knock that in. And I'm going to upsize my holes here in the frame from 7 16 to half inch and then use some half 13 hardware to pull all this together really good. Then do a little heating, a little beating, you know, a little welding, and should be good to go. That's my plan anyway. So in case anybody's wondering, this is the Rough Country patch kit. And I'm really happy with the way that it fit. You know, it wasn't perfect, but really close. Now, I enlarged my holes to half inch and used half 13 bolts to pull this thing down good and tight and then went around it with a hammer just to make sure that it was laid as close to the frame, you know, as tight up to the frame as possible. So it worked out really well, in my opinion. So now it's time to make this thing permanent onto the side of the frame here. And what I'm going to do and what the instructions recommend is to skip weld around this thing, not weld continuously around it, just weld a little bit and stop. Skip a bit, weld a little bit, you get the idea. Also going to plug weld up these holes, a little extra strength there, and then I can put the bottom plate on. So that turned out really nice. Still got one piece to put on, but before I do that, I need to fabricate me a brand new creeper real quick. If I can. Oh, this creeper's got staples in it. Those are hard on the back. Let's remove those. There we go. Let's modify it and make it a longer creeper. Okay, see how well that works. Slide it up under there. Ugh. Hmm. So if you're curious, 
on what weld through primer that I'm using. This is made by Sims, part number 40773. Dries really quick, I kind of like it because I have zero patience for paint to dry. And it's just to protect in between the two panels that we weld together so rust and stuff doesn't get started in between them. Yeah, you know, I've been using it on the body panels and it's worked pretty well. So that's what I'm using and I kind of like it. So you may hear my shop dehumidifier running in the background. It's a Storm LGR made by Lorair, and I bought it off you know, the website named after the river in the jungle probably six or eight months ago. Some of you guys who've watched me for a while may remember when I picked it up, and I've got quite a bit of time on this thing now, probably 2,500 plus hours on the unit, and it's been trouble free. So if you're dealing with humidity inside of your shop, high humidity, uh, some of you don't deal with it. I'm jealous. But we do here. Right now it's 89% humidity outside and I've got it down to 60 in here. I just turned that thing on. I keep my set point at about 50 and at that point I really don't see much trouble with rust and stuff in the shop and it doesn't run my dehumidifier to, to death. So this thing automatically collects the water from the air and then dumps it outside. And all I've had to do to this thing so far is just keep the filter clean. That's it. Blow it out every few days with air compressor. Done. So, if you're interested, you want to keep down the rust in your shop, and if your shop is somewhat sealed, you know, a simple dehumidifier may be the ticket if you don't already have an air conditioning unit or, you know, some other way to control the moisture in your air. So, just wanted to give an update on that because I know, you know, some people may be interested. So, there you go. Little Allure Air LGR has been working pretty good. And these large diamide clamps are awesome. D-I-M-I-D-E. These and the small ones, I think I've said it. I probably even said it in this video, I think. My favorite clamps. Hello, little Bobby. What are you doing? So thanks to the extremely unreliable nature of every GoPro camera that I've ever owned, I managed to not get one underneath shot of this bottom of the frame support or the steering box support here. Why? You know, because GoPros lock up constantly, because the red light flashes and they're not actually recording. It's one thing after another. They lock up, they cause me to miss shots, I've had all I can stand from GoPro. So there we go, I let the paint dry, and while it was, I painted up the steering box as well. So they both dried at the same time. It's the next morning. Let's put it on there and see how well it does. I'm, I'm interested to see if it tightened it up any, any. I'm sure it did. I also took some of the slop out of the steering box, which won't affect how much the steering box itself moves, but it does affect how much slop is in the steering wheel. So I adjusted that as well, just with this nut right here.
So there we go, all back together. Now I've literally been planning this repair for the last 20 years. Yes, I know I haven't had this truck for 20 years, but every four wheel drive Chevy half ton truck that I've had, other than one, has been broken here. And most of the time I just didn't worry about it and, and drove it, because you know, usually it was just a small crack. But this one, seeing as, got, as I've got it tore down as far as I have, and an awesome viewer sent me that kit, you know, you might as well go ahead and you know, fix on it a bit. I don't see how this could not help. We added quite a bit of reinforcement there. We welded up all the damage. Plus this kit ties the bottom of the frame more into that cross member there. And you know, probably the way it should have been done from the factory. You know, GM knew this was a problem after the first couple years of production and they chose to do nothing about it. So I guess it's our job. And if you have one of these trucks, Preferably, or usually it's the four-wheel drives that had damage in the frame at the steering box because of all the extra load that was added to it. But the two-wheel drives, they, they broke as well. And you may want to go out there and look at yours if you do have one and see if it's broke. But then again, you may not want to look and assume that it's good. I've done that before. So let me get you in the same position that we were when we tested this thing before I took the steering box off and we seen the flex in it and see if it made any difference. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that it did. I don't see how it couldn't. So, let me get you up here and we'll try it out because I haven't done that yet. Check that out. Oh yeah, that definitely helped. Definitely helped. I mean, it's still moving a little bit because, you know, everything moves, but nothing like it did before. That should make a huge difference in the way that this thing drives. Plus, I went ahead and adjusted the slop out of this box while I had it off. You know, pretty easy to do. You can look into that if you're interested. But awesome repair. It worked. So this Rough Country frame repair kit went on pretty well. About as good as you could expect. And I didn't buy it. Like I said, it was sent by a viewer, so thank you very much. Definitely a worthwhile repair or just reinforcement. It was so common for these half-ton frames to break at the steering box. And even if you have one that's not broken, it may be a good idea to put this kit on just to beef up the frame a bit there, because I'm sure it'll improve the handling and the response of the steering wheel, plus it'll keep your frame from breaking. Now, yes, you could have just welded the frame up like I did and bolted the box back on, but chances are it would break right back beside those welds and then you know, you'd be revisiting the repair. So this is the best way, in my opinion, to fix a frame that's broken at the steering box or one of these anyway. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anybody who's helped me out, much appreciated. So that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes. Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born You're just a flower on your own Waiting for the sun to blossom to break through